The struggle to survive in the world of one of the most mysterious industries can have far-reaching consequences for many owners of these expensive living works of art. Once a year, a particular place in Japan is transformed into the stage of one of the most prestigious world championships. These fish travel across Japan on their way to Tokyo for the main competition. But for some, this is more than just a competition. This is the Japanese koi, a fish that is considered one of the most valuable fish in the world and is seen as living works of art. My name is Ifo and I'm 34 years old. Last year I quit my job as a police officer to pursue a career in the world of this special fish. In my previous trip I visited Niigata Prefecture on the west coast of Japan, Honshu Island and found answers to the question of how this fish is bred in Japan. In my search for experience and knowledge I tried to create my own future path and take you along this journey. In this video I travel to the south of Japan to Hiroshima Prefecture, an area with a lot of history but above all a place where many stories are hidden. Okay, let's go. The Japanese koi is one of the most uniquely bred fish in the world and is considered the most valuable ornamental fish. The Japanese koi is very popular with pond owners and is also the national fish of Japan, represents love and friendship and often appears at ceremonial gatherings such as this one with former President Trump during a visit to former Prime Minister of Japan. The Japanese koi can therefore be found everywhere in the streets of Japan, especially in Niigata Prefecture, where the fish originally comes from. In this documentary, we travel to the south of Japan, an area where Japan's most famous and perhaps best breeders are located and where the most expensive Japanese koi has been sold. Among all these Japanese breeders, I meet a special man from England who left everything behind, sold his house, built his own greenhouse in Japan all by himself and is pursuing his dream of winning the biggest prize on one of the biggest stages in Japan. We follow him during the weeks before the big show with the aim of finding answers for my own career path within this unique world of the Japanese koi fish. The starting point of my 24 hour journey is the Netherlands. This is where my long but especially special journey begins. It is January and my journey starts at Schiphol, the largest airport in the Netherlands. From here it's a 13 hour flight and approximately 8 hours to Sera, a beautiful mountain town about one hour drive from Hiroshima, located in the south of Japan. 
In Japan as a foreigner it's advantageous to travel by Shinkansen, the well-known bullet train, or by plane, which also has special rates for foreigners. I choose to travel by train after arriving in Tokyo. In Japan, you can buy a Japan Real Pass for about 300 US dollars, which gives you unlimited travel throughout Japan by train. Traveling by public transport is very well organized in Japan. The trains are clean and everything is indicated in Japanese and English. After almost 24 hours of traveling, I arrive at my first destination. I'm very tired and I'm happy that I can go straight to my hotel room. It's the first day of my trip. I'm staying in a small hotel run by an older lady. It is the first hotel ever where I'm given my own slippers upon arrival. I have to leave my own shoes at the front door. It gives a homely feeling. Today I meet Mike Schneiden, an Englishman with a special story and a special dream. During this trip I follow Mike and hope to be inspired by his story. Good morning, Michael. <laughs> How you doing? Good morning. Hi, hey, Anna. Konnichiwa. It was 1993 when Mike first came into contact with Koi. And in no time he was hooked on the mysterious world of the Japanese koi. Mike decided to enter a competition for the first time in 1997. A koi show is a competition where a fish is judged on its beauty and technical aspects such as build, length and skin quality. He was successful and won the grand champion, the biggest prize there was to win. Not much later he founded Yume Koi in 2000 in the UK. Mike decided to leave everything behind and emigrate to Japan in 2020. Not everyone believed in his dream. Many koi breeders, who were good friends with him, said he would fail. We have arrived at Mike's koi house. This greenhouse is located on a beautiful mountain slope. There is little to see from the outside, but inside there are beautiful works of art each selected by Mike at young age. I'm curious about his story and life here in Japan and look at this beautiful Japanese koi. I'm Mike Snaden. Um, originally I'm from Bristol in the UK. Uh, moved here three years ago to basically follow this dream which has become Yume Koi Japan. So what the business model is or should I go back a little step to the UK. What the business model, model was back in those days was actually buying fish from Japanese breeders and obviously selling them as a dealer to hobbyists but the focus always was on trying to grow fish big and trying to get fish to the koi show and kind of win as many grand champions as possible. For me that was always the thing that drove my passion in koi was trying to grow koi and get the most out of them. So now here in Japan, I'm basically doing the same thing. Although the business model predominantly is actually supplying koi dealers around the world, trying to build up a network of people who we can support and who can also support us as a team. Um, but at the same time, to raise fish here, like special fish, that's the aim um, for hobbyist dealers and get those fish to koi shows in Japan. That is the, the big dream here. We took fish to the All Japan show for the first time last year when it was held in Niigata and this year we are taking some fish to Tokyo Koi Show again which for us is actually the first time taking koi there. Of course we've exhibited fish there in the past but they've always been handled by other breeders and so this time is the first time that we will be personally handling fish that we will take to the show as you make Koi Japan in Tokyo. It took almost a year for Mike's koi house to take shape. With the help of both Japanese breeders and a construction company, he managed to build this facility in a very short time. I noticed that Mike is excited about the show that will take place in Tokyo in a few days. 
The show is considered at the highest stage and where only the best fish in the world are exhibited. The next few days will be exciting. Mike's tells me the fish must be brought to the show in Tokyo in top condition. The upcoming show is important for Mike's future and company. Everything has to go well. Mike proposes to drive to his mud pond and he wants to introduce me to a Japanese friend. A Japanese koi hobbyist with a special pond, but not on an empty stomach. If you like food, Japan is the country to go to. Today on the menu, spicy ramen. And spicy, it was. We are on our way to Mike's outdoor growing pond. I'm curious what challenges he had emigrating to Japan. Things really didn't go quite to plan in some regards. I, many years ago, I actually um, started talking to breeders about wanting to grow fish in Japan and wanting to have ponds here in Japan. And basically, I was laughed at by breeders back in those days um, because it's like, well, how are you going to do that? Um, there's no way that you could run the ponds or find somebody to run the ponds you wanted to run them. And so it's kind of funny really that right now, you know, these years on, I find myself exactly in this position where I do have ponds in Japan, but actually as it happens, I am now in Japan and it's not something that I ever anticipated happening. Um, but as you can see, it has happened. I mean, there are cultural kind of challenges of course um, the one thing that I think can be frustrating as a newcomer in this country is that when somebody tells you something's okay it doesn't actually mean it's okay at all um, it is a prime example if you said to somebody um, over dinner oh do you mind if I just take this knife to your finger and cut your finger off you know they might turn around and say oh yeah okay that's fine actually it's not fine at all they don't want you to cut their finger off that it's obviously a, a, a major exaggeration, but it is a little bit like that culture here. Like someone might say to you, oh yeah, oh, and next time you need to cut your weeds, why don't you use my lawnmower, that kind of thing. And then the one day you do actually knock on the door and say, actually, I'll come around, can I uh, take you up on your offer and borrow your lawnmower, please? They're like mortified, you know, wow, the nerve. I can't believe you actually want to borrow my lawnmower. So it's like in England, our way of talking is, I think a lot, softer but also very straightforward like you know this is okay this is not okay if I offer for you to use my whatever it is it's because it is actually okay to use it so in that regard England is, is quite a lot different from Japan I think the basic way of behaving I think in actual fact English society isn't massively different from Japan We have arrived at Mike's Mud Pond. This is the pond where the fish swim during the spring, summer and autumn. Mike explains why he uses this mud pond. Well, and as you can see, uh, the mud pond is quite a sizable one. Um, it's about five or six meters deep, so it's also quite deep. Now, the advantage is really with it, this kind of size mud pond, this kind of water depth is good in so far as, to me, People might say, okay, the body shape's gonna be good, it's more water pressure for the body. For me, that's not actually the main point. The main point with a pond of this size is that in the summer in Japan, the temperatures do get really, really hot. And it's quite commonplace for temperatures to ride, let's say above 30 degrees. And when that happens, the fish lose appetite. So whenever that does happen, you're losing feeding time, growing time with the fish. So with a pond of this size and this kind of water depth, five, six meters, the highest this rose through last year was about 26 and a half, 27 degrees, and it wasn't up around that high for very long. And typically speaking, the water temperature is around sort of 24. So to me, it's ideal because if you're trying to raise fish really well, if that temperature does go too high and you're suspending feeding, then you're not getting A, as much growth and B, as much volume. You start getting the fish losing weight. If that temperature goes too high, oxygen levels fall too, too much and then the appetite falls and then 
met metabolically speaking, the fish grow longer too quickly with higher temperature, but they don't eat enough to keep up the body weight. So this pond, I think is the perfect really scenario for raising fish and getting good bodies on them and good growth as well. That depth I think is really quite paramount to keeping the temperature in the kind of levels that you would want it to be ideally speaking. Raising koi is a technical story that has been passed down from generation to generation among the Japanese koi breeders. I noticed that Mike knows a lot and I tried to remember as much as possible. We have little daylight left, so we drive to a Japanese hobbyist friend who wants to show me his koi pond. It is winter, not the most ideal time to visit an authentic Japanese garden and pond. I have visited many ponds and gardens all over the world, but never a Japanese koi pond. Mike introduced me to Muraoka-san, the owner of this beautiful koi pond and garden. Mike tells me that Muraoka-san also takes care of his growing pond we just visited. Today we are at the garden pond of Muraoka-san. Muraoka-san is He's basically the local community leader who is in charge of controlling our mud pond and which rice fields surrounding the mud pond actually get the water from that pond and how much they get. So he controls all of that, which means that everyone in this surrounding area gets enough water, but also our fish that are in the mud pond aren't at risk from water level you know, getting lower. So he takes care of everything. He's got this garden pond here. Um, as you can see, it's got big rocks and things around there. Um, and what he was saying a moment ago before you started filming is that in Hiroshima area, or generally speaking in Japan, people don't really have ponds so much like this. And certainly ones with big rocks um, and big trees like that around it are really quite rare. It's not really commonplace in Japan to have you know such nice ornamental ponds like this. I am very impressed by the gigantic bonsai trees and the size of the stones. I notice that there is a very peaceful atmosphere around this garden and I imagine how beautiful it is here in spring and summer. As you know I think yourself in Europe and England people tend to have a pond that is just a koi pond for koi so maybe it's just concrete rectangular and so on but really this is kind of what everything is about in Japan with Nishikigoi and Bonsai, the combination of the two. Um, so it's really, I, I think in a way, got a lot of prestige to have a pond that's done in this kind of style. Because, I mean, even getting the rocks alone, I think is really very expensive, costly and difficult. It's not just buying the rocks, it's actually finding rocks like this in the first place as well. So I think this is kind of really as nice as garden ponds get without actually going to a huge Japanese garden. Um, I think this is, well, personally superb. Um, it's now, or oh, getting on for 8 p.m. on Monday, prior to the show. And what we're doing now is moving the fish that are going to the show to these canvas pools um, with a little salt in there as well. And basically the idea is that the fish can clear out any um, waste that's inside them and we can net that out in the morning. Um, and then the fish can also be lowered in temperature with the salt. And then what we'll do on the day of packing on Wednesday is pack into fresh water and no salt. Um, and send the fish to the show from there. So this is basically to so that we can let the temperature fall down a little bit and the new water that's behind you as well in the tank we can let that fall down at the same rate and um, hopefully that preparation will be good enough to give the fish that little bit of extra nice condition for the show. It worked well last year, the fish got their pristine so hopefully it will work again this year, fingers crossed. It's a long day, we're back at Mike's Koi House. Tonight, the preparation starts for the upcoming show that will take place in Tokyo in a few days from now. 
I'm curious whether Mike is excited to travel to Tokyo with his valuable fish. There's nothing exciting about this. Um, the concept of the show is exciting, being at the show is exciting. The preparation is just well, is stressful and makes me nervous. So, uh, because everything's got to be just right, it's so easy to make some kind of mistake, damage the fish or anything can happen. So yeah, stressful. Mike works late into the evening, but it's time to go back to the hotel. Tomorrow promises to be a beautiful day. Today is a special day. Mike has promised to show us some of his beautiful fish and then he will take us to two famous Japanese koi breeders who he considers as good friends. This koi, for those people that maybe aren't so new to the hobby, or sorry, aren't so old to the hobby, um, is Sanke, or otherwise known as Taisho Sanshoku. Sanshoku meaning three colors. Um, so you've got basically a kahaku in this case with smaller sumi markings. So sumi, yeah, basically is black. Sumi is also another word for like ink or squid ink. So if you look at squid, the black ink that they um, screw it out if you upset them that is basically what sumi is um, and that's really how you would identify it as being a sanke um, whereas showa on the other hand would be much more dominant in the sumi area or the sumi element of the fish so as I say this is sanke um, for me I think this is a particularly nice example this fish actually came here as nisai I think it was 54 or 55 centimeters in spring of last year. Um, the fish is now sands, I now measures 67 cm. Um, this body structure I think is really, really nice on this fish. The fish isn't carrying any excess weight. The overall like, height structure of the fish is nice. The body line of the fish is really nice. The amount of body shape it's carrying for this age I think is pretty much ideal. Head shape as well I think is really nice. Colour quality on this fish is, I think, extremely good. Um, Kiva also is very nice. Sashi style is very nice. Sashi being the front edge of the pattern where the red scales basically underlie white skin. That area, the refinement's really good and to me that area is actually very important because the sashi area really determines how refined the koi will be when the fish grows up. So it is really important. Sumi placement on this fish is beautiful. Um, if you look just behind the head, we've got that kind of area of shoulder sumi there, but even if that wasn't there, the next area further back on the shoulder is just really nicely placed, that area of sumi. Um, and all of the sumi through the fish is just really balanced and I think just the right amount of sumi. And I think with this quality of sumi in the future, it will thicken up and consolidate and hopefully, by my impression of it, hopefully will become really nice and refined. You won't end up with any like small, low quality sumi. It should be nice, decent sized blocks of sumi with really nice finish to the sumi and also really nice kiwa to the sumi, which is also important. So sumi finish in itself is actually just as important, just as important as the actual sumi quality itself. And I think this fish in those areas I think really is extremely good. After this short masterclass, I realized that Mike has an enormous amount of knowledge about koi. I learned a lot from him in just a few days. It is cold for this time of the year and snow is expected. Mike takes me to koi breeders where he regularly comes to buy his fish. Before we drive that way, Mike introduced me to his wife at one of the best hamburger restaurants in the region. So we've just had lunch in Serra after leaving Yumiko Japan. We are now heading out on one of my um, very frequent trips to Sakai Company, which is about 35 minute drive, so not very far. Um, and they're reasonably close to Hiroshima Airport. So we're gonna go there first and take a look around, see what they've got. 
and then after that we will I guess we'll be there maybe 30 or 30 minutes maybe an hour but we'll head out after that to go and see our Mosako and um, which again is another um, usual visit for me um, actually Sakai Company is literally en route, so if I was to drive to Omo Sako, I'm almost driving directly past it, um, Sakai Company anyway, so um, it makes good sense to go and see both in one trip as it were. Expanding on the legacy of Sakai Fish Farm, Sakai Company was founded in 2014 by Yoshimichi Sakai and Son. They are situated near Tohidoshima Airport. Using bloodlines from the Sakai fish farm, they are building on a sustainable future. Koi farming in Japan is a multi-million dollar business and was number 28th in Japan export rankings last year. I note that Mike is received as a friend. I'm curious about the mutual relationship. I think, I mean, this is one of our main breeders, um, Sakai Company. And Obviously because I like the fish, but also I think the relationship we have here I think is pretty good. And Motu Haru San, year before last, was kind enough to um, let us use two of his staff to help with various jobs at our place, like FRP and FRP preparation of the concrete, and also painting the top of the walls, that kind of thing. So um, they are really nice people, to be fair. One of the staff that I was talking to a minute ago was actually since left, that's um, Umeda San, Kenta Umeda. Um, he's left and gone to work for his father now in their family business, which is Umeda Yogyo, who is a, like a Japanese agent, the same as we are, and doing the same work. So, but no, he's a really, really nice guy. And I think, to be fair, everybody here is. So, yeah. Very kind. Hey, come on, you go first. <laughs> okay. If you want to compete for the big prices, like in a few days from today, you have to be skilled enough to pick the right fish that has the most potential to become a champion. I just, um, my way really with places like this is when I'm looking for koi, what I like about it is to just come here and I usually just stay and watch the pond myself and sometimes maybe like for an hour or two and just study the koi and get some like familiar familiarization with body structure of the koi, colour, keyword, that kind of thing. And then once I've done what I want to do and seen everything that I want to see, it's only then that I'll go and get help and say, OK, right, can I see this koi and this koi and so on. And usually like autumn time, the way they do things is to literally just take pictures of fish from above on the pond using the iPhone just to remember which fish is which and then get the boss over and then say, OK, then I want to see this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then it's, yeah, get everything in the bowl together. So um, the usual style. So when I come here, it's quite normal to see me just staring into the pond like I'm completely vacant and there's no one home. We're now just leaving Sakai Company. Temperature is plummeting. We're at minus three at the moment. It's going to go down to about minus eight or nine um, in the next couple of hours. So we're now heading off down to Omosako, who is basically the capital of Shiro Utsuri, as it were. So um, a world full of black and white. Omosako Koi Farm was founded in 1960 in Kure City in Hiroshima Prefecture. The farm is run by Takashi Omosako, who specializes in breeding Shiro Utsuri, a black fish with white patterns. Truly a beautiful variety that is very popular with pond owners. It is busy today. Just like Mike, the farm is preparing for the upcoming competition. Let's go and take a look around. I'm just going to show you the stuff that's going to the show. Oh wow, yeah, cool. So we're now in the fish house to see the koi that Omosaka have taken to Tokyo Koi Show this weekend. So we've got two ponds here, um, and as you'll see in a second, 
predominantly Surrey, Surrey and a few Kazaki as well. Um, one shower by the looks of it, but let's take a look. The fish are really beautiful. It remains special how relaxing it is to watch these beautiful animals for a while. We get a full tour of the farm, which consists of several koi houses. I could stay here for hours. Unfortunately, we have to leave. The show starts in two days and tomorrow we have to pack all the fish and send them to Tokyo. I wake up in a snowy world, quite unique to Hiroshima. Tomorrow Mike and I leave for Tokyo for the World Championships. Today, the fish must be transported and therefore safely packaged. Tomorrow we will fly to Tokyo together with the Japanese breeders to wait for the fish at the show. We start the day with coffee from the 7-Eleven and drive to a friend of Mike. We still have a few hours left for something fun. Mike wants to show me the pond of Takuyama-san, a koi hobbyist and friend who has beautiful koi. So, Good morning, Evo. Um, welcome here. This is Tokiyama Sands Base. Um, he lives near uh, well, in Onomichi City, which is near Hiroshima. And I brought you here today, Evo, so that you can have some inspiration for the pond that you are planning to build. This will perhaps give you some other kind of ideas on things that you want to implement when you come to build your pond, hopefully within this year. So come and take a look around and see what ideas you can use. I am warmly welcomed. Even a chair is set up so I can watch the koi. After this trip I want to start building my own koi pond. Something I've been dreaming about for years. I want to gain inspiration and try to collect as much information as possible and take a look around. I am curious how long Takuyama-san has been collecting koi and where he gets his koi from. Uh, about uh, 440 Yes. Uh, so he's 63 years old, so yeah, been keeping koi since he was 23. In Niigata Prefecture, Dainichi. So mainly it's Takigawa koi that are in here. But yeah, some other koi farms fish also. While enjoying something to drink, we take the time to view the ponds and fish. I feel honored that I can come here and look at these amazing koi. Takuyama-san is a very sincere and friendly host. He wants to take a picture before we leave as a memory. He also has a message for Mike. Uh, I wish uh, tomorrow your big prize. <laughs> Today for me is uh, one of stress and panic, so just final preparation. We need to obviously pack the koi and get those to Kodani parking area to meet the truck and load them up. But in addition to that we need to think about all the smaller details like oxygen bottle, um, spare bags for the return journey, uh, packing all of that and all the other equipment like net for scooping out any waste that's in the pool at the show. Um, so all of the, the finer details that are so easy to miss and forget. So uh, for me, of course most of that's already done, but it doesn't stop me from panicking that maybe I've missed something anyway. So yeah, there's no second chances with this. I notice that I'm starting to get nervous. 
I feel the tension and enthusiasm in Mike and we drive back to the farm. A koi breeder friend is waiting for us here, who will help with packing the fish. Together they study the fish one more time before sending them to Tokyo. The koi are carefully packed with enough water and oxygen for the journey to Tokyo. Koi can survive in the box this way for 40 to 72 hours. Hasai Takigawa and Mike work carefully to ship the fish as safely as possible. We have to hurry, the truck is already waiting for all the breeders in the region on a parking lot next to the highway. We are still on time. As much as Mike wants to have everything under control, he discusses the route with the driver. So much snow has fallen that highways are closed. Luckily, they have an alternative route to Tokyo. Okay, let's go. All good. All good? Yeah, for now we can rest easy because from this point there's nothing we can do until we get, get to the Koi Show tomorrow. So we've done everything we can do and the rest is now beyond all our control, which is right now it's the easiest place to be. It's time to travel where it all has to happen. Mike picks me up at the hotel and we drive to Hasai Takigawa who also flies with us from Hiroshima to Tokyo. While we were sleeping, the fish arrived at the show venue where they are waiting for us so we can help unload the fish and take them to the temporary show barrels. I sense a certain relief from Mike, who has done everything he can to get the fish ready for the competition. But is it good enough? The coming weekend will be dedicated to the All Japan Koi Show, the most important competition of the year. Like a military operation, all breeders from Japan unload their valuable koi from the trucks. As the Japanese can do, it happens in the right order. Mike is standing outside, waiting for his turn to pick up his koi and look at them. The fish must be in top condition to compete for the big prizes. Yeah, we finally arrived here at the Ryutsu Center and we are now waiting for the koi to arrive. I mean, actually the koi are already here, but the loading bays are all at the moment um, occupied with other trucks. So as soon as there's space uh, available, 
the truck with all of our area's fish on will be brought up to here so that we can unload the fish and bring them inside and unpack them. So hopefully that's going to happen quite quickly because I'm starting to build up an appetite. And of course I need energy to be able to lift fish. Yeah, so finally the truck's now on the loading bay, or unloading bay, so uh, time to get everything off and get it all into the balls. Mike patiently waits his turn. The koi are transported along their length so that they are not damaged when braking or accelerating. Some breeders choose to build entire water tanks into their trucks. Everything's a weight. Everything looks okay. Um, one fish, the water's a bit dirty. I don't know quite why. Maybe it's better, bit, I don't know. Um, but we just need to unbag the fish now and dispose of the water, or as much of the water from the bags as possible. It's probably basically lifting them out of there and putting them back into the boxes again and taking them outside. So, yeah, here goes nothing. S satisfied with that part? Yeah, um, just hopefully now the condition Tomorrow and beyond will be looking good so that um, hopefully they can do the best they can do. The judging will take place today in the early morning and behind closed doors. This is the day Mike has been living for lately. I have exclusive access and I can film how the koi are judged, but not everything. I've been given very strict rules so that the prize winners are not announced early. Today only, the press and jury are welcome. After hours of judging, all prize winners have been announced. The big prize, the grand champion, has been won by Sakai Fish Farm from Hiroshima with this very impressive fish, a fish that will now increase in value and is even more loved by enthusiasts. I congratulate Kentaro Sakai, and I'm curious about the bloodline of this champion. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, the Sanke that won Grand Champion? This Grand Champion Sanke, all springs of Shogetsu, and six years old, one meter. This is uh, so Shogetsu, so Miss Japan 2 bloodline. I cross uh, Kashi bloodline male Sanke. Future, I think uh, I want to make one point one meter oh, wow. in two years. Then I challenge all Japan again. Mike is not yet at the show, and the award ceremony is about to start. I decide to call Mike without telling him if he won any prize. So, good morning or good afternoon. 
Um, so here now at the Ryutsu Center and I didn't come to the show yesterday because obviously it was closed for judging and I didn't really see too much point in coming late in the day um, after the judging was finished so um, here now today and I think it's a pretty good result for us for UA Koi Japan I think um, well we've got five fish that obviously you know that you've already taken movies off um, that we brought to the show um, the best result we've got is one Sanka here that's 80 cm in 80 boo class. Um, that fish last year got a third prize and obviously a third prize is a lot less significant because there are quite a number of third prizes given out. Whereas second prize to me is massively more significant so that I'm particularly happy with, really really happy with that result because I think that 80 boo class um, particularly in any Go Sanki variety, I think is a really, really tough glass because in this case, this fish is something that we've grown up, so as the fish gets older, it's harder to keep the fish looking nice. Um, so to me, it's kind of like an endorsement or testament to the fact that we must surely have done something right. So that I'm really, really, really happy with. I'm happy with the other results too, but to get a second for me is actually quite a big deal personally, so I'm really pleased with that. I have come to the conclusion that pursuing your dreams is extremely important. And I made the right choice by quitting my job. My journey continues and I will continue to share it with you. Making this documentary takes a lot of time and money. I would appreciate it if you leave a comment and subscribe to my channel so you can follow me in pursuing my own dreams. I would like to thank Mike and Yume Koi for a special insight into his life and sharing his experiences. I'll keep following Mike, and who knows, you will see him in our next movie.